Welcome, welcome, welcome back, everybody. I hope everybody is doing fantastic. How are all those masters of your own destiny doing? Are you close to your destination? I hope so. Hey, it's all about putting the hard work and be persistent. I promise you, you will get there. I'm Francisco Suarez, your host, and this is from Suarez Basement, a podcast created especially for everybody out there who is interested in the communication media and the arts. Before we start our full episode, I want to show you a very quick click of a movie with the music and without the music for you to understand the importance and the relevance of the work of our expert today. The movie is Yo, the famous movie from Steven Spielberg. Let's listen and let's watch right now. Let's 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 do it. First without the score. Your turn, Quinn. Hooper, where are you? Hooper, hurry it up now, tie it on. Hurry it up, he's coming straight for us. Don't screw it up now. Don't wait for me. Come on, Hooper, come on, hurry it up, tie it on. Now. And here he now. is with his score. Tie it up, will you? Your turn, Quinn. Hurry it up now, tie it on. Hurry it up, he's coming straight for us. Don't screw it up now. Don't wait for me. Come on, Hooper, come on. Hurry it up, tie it on. Isn't that incredible? How the score of a movie can change completely the perception, the feeling of a scene. And that is where I want to remind our students and everybody who's listening out there that it's not about only the visuals, but it's also about the audio, it's about the score. And if it's an expert out there who can teach us and can talk to us about the amazing work of scores, is our guest today. We are incredibly pleased here in Francois' basement to have with us Robert Gerson Williams, who is a TV, film, and video game composers of scores. In fact, he won the European Film Composer Award for his amazing work in the score for Hotel Rwanda, but he's also behind some of the amazing movies such as Aquaman, Wonder Woman, Over the Edge, the B movie, and the hit TV show in Netflix, The Crown. So talking about having an expert in the basement, I want to thank, like always, to WCNY in Central New York for the partnership. Of course, you, the audience, is, is, it's important to remind you that it's because of you that we do this podcast. And let's start this new episode with Robert Gresson Williams, with the enthusiasm and with the eager to learn from him. Right away. Here we go. Rupert, so I want to welcome you to my basement. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Robert, let's let's do this one. The first thing I always uh, tell my students is that when we talk to somebody like you, uh, y you know, things doesn't happen overnight. You have a progression of your career. Can we go back to your time in the university and how suddenly you realized that music was something that you want to pursue and how you start working in the television and the motion picture? Industry. Well, I, I knew I wanted to be a musician at a very early age, not, a, not necessarily a composer, but I, I was a, a musician from the age of seven and then in a, in a choir singing as a chorister at Cambridge in England um, from eight till 13. So I, it was kind of a professional situation where we, um, we sung every day and we were trained to quite a high standard. And so I knew that I was going to be a musician um, because it, it was in my blood. My family are all musicians my father was a musician my mother was and 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 a lot of my other my siblings are too so um as you probably know and um so i always knew i was going to be a, a a musician but probably i at one point i i wanted to be in a band and i was in plenty of bands I wanted to be a rock star i wanted to uh you know just play hammond organ in the in the back and have fun in in, in a rock band and it was only in my teens and late teenage years where I came across a composer called Richard Harvey, who is a very, very good English composer, who was good friends with Hans Zimmer, 
uh, and did lots of work with him. And so I, I started off a, a, an apprenticeship with, with Richard, um, which then took me on to being an apprentice with, with Hans Zimmer. And then that's when my career really took off. So, but, but there was a time uh, for me where, where I decided from being a, uh, that I was never going to be good enough to be a, a performer, mm -hmm. but uh, per uh, composition, I was always uh, very big on, um, on in, uh, improvising, and my 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 family must have just just hated when I went to the piano because I would all sorts of stuff would come pouring out. None of it very good, but it was all experimental, you know. Um, and I spent a lot of time, probably from the age of fourteen to sixteen, seventeen, trying to find. I never was really taught composition, um, but I was. I, so I just found my way around um, uh, the, the harmonic scale really and just trying to work out what I like to hear um and then working for other composers I got my um I you know I I cut my teeth as it were with uh Richard Harvey and then Hans Zimmer so this apprenticeship thing is is quite big in our world I don't know if it's the same with other um uh, other top liners in in the film industry you know um with cinematographers or 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 such but with uh, with composers it's a very um common way to get back get into the into the business is to is to work for somebody who's really doing it and you're lucky to get a job with somebody who's working let's talk about your job in the sense of creativity because i'm fascinated with what you do i you know a, a movie or a tv show is a visual storytelling but the audio and the score tell also the story so in your opinion of what how important is the score of a movie in order to tell the story um i think it depends um the score is very is uh, it, obviously i would say this but the score is terribly important and it can affect the story mm -hmm. um sometimes you're telling more of a story musically you're given the opportunity by the director to tell more of a story than other times other times you have to be in the background and you're just creating an atmosphere because the story is so present on the screen and I think that is part of the skill too is to know when to play and to sing out and to be first chair be the be the thing that is happening now and, and telling the story and when to sit back and that that is very, very important I've, I've done a lot of um, comedy in my time and that also that the timing of comedy you know my my first reaction when i first did a first com my comedy was to to support every joke or to react to every joke which you know when i met adam sandler for the first time it was like if you're having to tell everybody that that joke was funny i'm cutting it out of the movie stop telling them that it's funny they know it is or or i'm cutting it out and it was a really good lesson um so same with with the score if if the director you're lucky enough for the director to give you a big wide open shot or an opening title sequence imagine that you don't get very many of those these days where you can say to everybody this is what the story is about i'm going to tell you musically what to expect um doesn't happen so much these days but um yeah um, it, it, it really depends on Right, and I, I mean, I mean, we can go through the the history of cinema and find those scores that literally became part of the story, right? At Star Wars and Cinema Paradiso, and I mean, so many of uh, good examples of where the score is part of the story itself. Yes, and actually, even sometimes quite opposite to how you would expect the score to be. Uh, once upon a time in America, you know, the score is not doesn't really say much about the city or about America. In fact, the instruments are being used as sort of South American anyway, but there's just something that gets deep into the emotion of the love story. Uh, and, you know, we're going to use some South American instruments, uh, mm -hmm. which, which, which produce the emotion that is, you know, someone else, if, if the score, if it, I'd been given the chance to do that, I would not have played it that way. And it wouldn't have been so effective for the love story. I might've played, something you know something more about the tension in the city or, or mm -hmm. something but Morigoni went straight into the into the love which which is interesting and and mm -hmm. why he's you know who he is. so tell me tell me a little bit I, i'm fascinated about i mean i know that the process uh, is hard to put it in steps but let's see if we could put your creative yeah. process in certain steps 
how did you start? Like, what is your first meeting? Did you meet with directors or with the producer? When did you start really sitting down and composing certain things? I, you know, let, let's see if we can put it in certain layers. Yeah, it, it does depend on the movie. I've had, uh, for an example, when I, when I did um, Hacksaw Ridge with Mel Gibson, I literally went into a room with him and we sat down at a piano, the first meeting. I watched the film and we sat down at a piano and actually did, I didn't write anything of any use at all. And I said, look, just let me go home and I'll go home and I'll, I'll write something of use. Luckily, I did. But, but um, what normally happens is I'll be given a script. Um, this is perhaps by a director that I've never worked with before. I'll be sent a script. They will then want to get on a Zoom call like we're having and they'll want to hear what I feel about their script, what I feel I can bring to the story, or what I feel sometimes if you're brave enough, you'll, uh, which comes with confidence and, and having done this for a little while, what you feel the script perhaps is lacking and what you can perhaps bring to, to fill that gap. Or just coming up with a, a great idea, just some instrument that's going to, um, is going to tell a story. Then you either get the job or you don't. <laughs> and then once you have, you, they go away, they shoot their movie, or, and you um, hopefully get, I've, uh, for instance, there's a, there's a movie I'm doing at the moment um, where they're sending me the, the dailies, which is when they're, they're, shoot, they're, on, they're on set, and they're sending me little, little scenes that they're shooting, and their editor's actually cutting some scenes together, and I'm getting an idea of what I want to do. In fact, I've, got, I've sneakily been actually writing and making a little notepad of, of things. I have a computer here. There you go. It's just turned itself off. Mm -hmm. like that. Oh, there it's still off. Um, I basically with a, with a with a I could just have any instrument I want, but generally I'll go over to the piano or to the computer on a piano sound, and I'll just um, write some themes or I'll write something thematic. Sometimes it'll last eight or ten minutes, um, mm -hmm. just because I just find if I, while I'm watching I'll get into it and I'll I want to develop into something. Oh yes, this would be good for somewhere in the film. Um, I'll send that to the director and we'll have conversations about it. And that's really the first creative conversation I'll have with the director where he, he, you know, often they'll want to have a big say on what I write. And sometimes they'll say, please, I'd love to hear what you are going to bring to the story. I don't want to affect what mm -hmm. you do. Well, and, and, and you were talking, of course, it is it's so important because the only way that you're going to be able to contribute with this creative process is to really understand the vision of the director. So it's through those yeah. conversations and those uh, walking in the morning and to be able to create that human relationship with the person who is responsible of the story. Yes, and there's a, there's a lot of trust there really as well. I mean, if you think about it, um, a score can make a film it can, or it can just support a film or it can be a, another character in the film, but it also can ruin a film. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of trust the director you know, it must feel quite hard for some directors if it's a first time relationship. I, I have some relationships with people who I've worked with for many, many years, or I've worked with at least once or twice before. And so there is some trust already there. They know, I know what they like. I know, I, I know, I, I know when they say to me something and I, and I have to interpret differently. And that's, that's also another part of the job is when someone says something, you don't have to take it at face value. It might be an insecurity on their part. They might be very insecure about something and come across very, very confidently about it and knowing them or being able to read human instinct, you know, instinctively read human behavior. You, you, you can pull things out that way. But um, yeah, I would say spend, if I'm lucky enough to spend time with a director um, during the early process, mm. then that's when I've written the best scores. Sometimes when you don't have a lot of time as well. Mm. Hacksaw Ridge, I, I literally had three weeks to, from my first meeting with Mel to when we were recording at Abbey Road. And there was no time to, um, to procrastinate or to lie on the sofa at the back of the studio worrying about whether I was going to make it or not. It's just get in there. And, and and do it and uh, and and spend some time with him on the themes. Do you think the creative process suffers sometimes when you have to have so tight deadlines, or you are getting to a point where you are so accustomed to the fact? Because it's true, the the, the industry doesn't matter how creative you are, you have to be ready on time. You have to deliver. Do you think yeah. it influences your creativity, or you are to a point where that doesn't matter? 
Uh, no, it does influence your creativity, but I mean, sometimes it depends on the film also. Uh, the kind of superhero films like, um, I mean, we've been talking about films exclusively um, and we can talk about TV in a moment if you like, that's a very different sort Deep of film, correct. Um, but with movies, um, especially superhero movies, I mean, Wonder Woman and Aquaman or and going to Legend of Tarzan, those three, that there, there was, apart from there being an enormous amount of music to write, and also there's a lot of CGI, especially in the Wonder Woman and, and Aquaman. So the last reel, which could be the last 20 minutes, is only coming into form in the last sort of two or three weeks before I've already got a big orchestra booked, you know. So that last surge, the last month can be, you know. Mm. Get and Robert, now that you brought, it's, it's very interesting that you brought the case between television and movie because the cool, the, the amazing part about your career is that you have worked in an amazing amount of motion pictures, but you also have worked in television in shows like The Crown, which is one of my favorites. By the way, The Holiday is one of my favorite movies too. I love that movie. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, what is the difference? Because uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the television have uh, more tight deadline for you to be ready for production you do it becomes a bit of a production line actually in truth but if you get in early enough the crown was i was very lucky i got hired for the crown uh, I, I i don't remember the amount of time but it was a lot of time i spent i spent months with peter morgan um flying ideas around uh, we flew to la together and spent some time um with some friends over there then came back here and um uh, I think I must have spent three or four months on 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 uh, themes before I I wrote wrote a scene, and then but then once you get into the the roller coaster of of TV, it's okay. So I mean I'm just about I've just started a t TV series, and um, I know it's, I'm still in still <laughs> formulating how it's going to sound. But once we start recording in September, it's every three weeks we're going to do. 40 minutes of music you know and then that's obviously is head down and just just write it but you know all the work that's being done now prepares prepares you for it more than it does with 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 a movie you sort of gradually get into it and you build it towards a climax whereas you're 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 gathering all sorts of ammunition in tv uh, and then bang you're off and then you just have to deliver Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, as well. Yeah, especially shows like The Crown, where music also is so much part of the story, right? I mean, I, I, I have been yeah. watching the show and listen to your work, and it's just amazing because it really you can take certain scenes, and if you take out the music, it would be totally different story. Well, he's a beautiful writer, Peter Morgan, the the the, the, the creator and writer of the, of the Crown, and there's all sorts of underlying tensions in the story that he writes in clever dialogue. Um, but the, but that's why it's lovely to write music for his material because you 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 can send a scene off at a slightly different angle to to what is on the surface, and which which makes people sit a little bit in the front of their chair, and then they they notice something different, or they they notice a tension, or a, or or something about a character that you wouldn't necessarily notice. So it's it's nice that you that that, that you notice the music because you know the music is integral and very important to Peter in the storytelling, and that's an example of where the producer or the writer or the director came and said, you know, the music is as important as as any character in this. So. Um, so yes, it was quite a painful process to get there, but mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. but we, but getting there in the end did push me. And sometimes, what's exciting sometimes with this, with this work is 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 getting pushed. You know, is is getting pushed to your to the limits of your ability, or you you think, am I am I able to do this? And then, and then you then you manage it and uh that's exciting do you picture your melodies in your head first uh before you start working or how how that work in, in your creative aspect like like it, suddenly you start reading a script and suddenly in your head you start mm, mumming the, the song or the... often often that can happen yep yeah, yeah definitely um i've 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 written main themes on my way back from my meeting with the director you know in my in my head, I've got, I know exactly what it's going to be. But other times, uh, you know, with Wonder Woman or Aquaman, I, I or the Crown main theme, it took months. I mean, I've got folders on my computer that sort of 
that that that, that I'm I still have PTSD, you know, post traumatic. Uh-huh. <laughs> I can't open the fold within <laughs> there to say down theme effort number one through to fifty uh-huh. until fifty one uh-huh. uh, was the one. Um, but you know those those where, that's where you get the, you know that's where that's right. where it's special. So. Right. Right. And Rupert, talking about the student's process of creativity, I always say to the student, for example, when they're writing a script for television, it's my script writing class, or they are actually editing a film, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to pick your brain, your process of when to stop or when to don't discard something that you're working on. it. Because one of the things that happen with students is that they start working in a story and suddenly you know, 10 pages into it, it's like, mm, I don't like it. And they discard everything. And I say, no, 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 you have to keep going. And then you can start picking here and there. How, how that work for you? Well, you know, uh, this is why it's very different for everybody. And I don't, I don't want to, d- to disagree with you just for the sake of it. And it's not mm-hmm. just for the sake yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I learned, a gr- I learned, um, I mean, I do, I do agree with you that if you have an idea, just because it becomes difficult, do not give up. I mean, the, the, mm-hmm. the the difficult stuff is it's never going to come easily. I mean, if you get to page 10 of a script and it's difficult, don't, you know, don't throw it away until right. you're sure that it's not a bad idea just because it's difficult. Otherwise, how how is anything decent that's creative going to, to happen mm-hmm. if we give up when mm-hmm. it's hard? Because good stuff is always hard. Nothing comes easily um, most of the time. Yes. Um, but uh, I did learn a great thing actually, and I learned it from Hans from Hans Zimmer when I when I worked for him when I, I was his assistant uh, twenty years ago, and uh, I was shocked sometimes at how easily he would just um, that's not right, put it in the bin, and start again. Or actually, <laughs> quite often it would be my stuff that I was writing. He would sort <laughs> of I can't work with this. You could have start again. And it took a little bit of time for me to 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 be brave enough to sort of say, okay, that was a day's work or that was two days work. And, but actually, you know, rethink it. Um, so I think both can happen. I think that, you know, when things become hard, you, you've got to persevere. Otherwise, you know, like you say, it, it, it's very easy, especially when you're inexperienced or when you're young or when you're just really enthusiastic for something to be really great now, mm-hmm. because of course that's exciting when you're a composer or a musician, if it's really great now, that is where everything is fun. But it's not always fun to get to that elevated position. And let's re- the reality is that if you look back on something or if you achieve something that you didn't feel you could achieve mm-hmm. um, before, then it's 10 times more juicy than achieving something that comes easily to you. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, it's got to be the same for whether you're climbing a mountain or if, or if, you're, if, if you manage a, a big lift in the gym. It's it's the same with with music. If it, if something takes a lot of work to get to and you achieve it, it's it gives you something that no not many people can you can't explain what that feeling is. Um, it's not just adrenaline, you know. And Rupert, almost uh, to finish, I know it's hard because, like I say, each of the composers that you have done, I'm sure, is like your little baby. So it's hard to pick which one is your favorite. But do you have in your repertoire of many, many uh, 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 compositions that you have done for movies or television, one or two that you feel like, oh, my God, I'm so proud of that? There's the opening titles for a little film, which I'm sure you haven't seen, called Thunderpants, uh, which is about a boy who, um, who farts and uh, powers a rocket towards the end with his wind. And I just love, I just, it brings back memories of writing that score because I worked with a, a, a director who became a great mate of mine. He spent a lot of time in my studio. It was the first time I had an orchestra, just, you know, the producer said to me, where do you want to record? I said, Abbey Road. He said, how big an orchestra do you want? And I said, I don't know, but I want three or four days with a 70, 80 piece orchestra. And it was just such a good memory. And, and I think it's a lot of fun. It's, it's not particularly well performed, it's not their fault. It was because, funnily enough, I wasn't particularly mm-hmm. advanced in the orchestration stage then. Mm-hmm. So, so, so sometimes I wrote things that um, were a bit difficult to play. But I just love the sort of recklessness of the thing. So, Thunderpants. But I mean, I guess the thing that the people most know me for, or when I when I meet people and who are composers and they want to talk about what I've done, it's most it's things like The Crown or Hacksaw Ridge. They're the two things that I'm I'm happy I did 
and I'm happy with the job I did. Um, Any favorites that are not yours that uh, were your inspiration in some point when you started in the business that are scores from movies that you feel like, oh, wow, this is so beautiful. And, uh, you know, uh, it's an inspiration for your own work. Well, I like over the years, I've loved, you know, different sorts of, I love beautiful scores, like the English Patient is a lovely score, or um, a very clever score, which is really very, very cool and very different, um, is Requiem for a Dream, Clint Mansell. It's just a, uh, a pretty horrific film, but it's, uh, the, the score is really, really um, out there. Um, and of course, you know, I, I became aware of film music with, with John Williams, you know, I became mm -hmm. aware with Star Wars. Mm, um, and mm. Superman, so of course, uh, of course, Superman. And uh, if you could write a score for your own life, uh, how it would sound, more or less, would be uh... <laughs> a good question. <laughs> uh, it might be solo double bass. Um, I don't know. I'm a bit, to be quite honest with you, I'm, I'm, a, I love. I, I mean, my heart is in orchestral music and choral music. Choral music is in my, mm -hmm. totally in my core, but I'm. Um, but I do love, I mean, I, if, if, if you said to me, what, would you like to go and play Whirly, you know, electric piano in a blues band in a pub in, down, in somewhere in the East End of London, I'd say, yes, please. <laughs> um, it, might, it might have a bit of electric piano, Whirly, and it might have a double bass next to it. Some guy smoking a cigarette, playing the trumpet. I don't know, but something ah, like that. I like that. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Well, start, start thinking about it. You never know. <laughs> Well, I appreciate so much your time. I, I it, what an awesome conversation, and we learn a lot from you. And, and all the best for your next projects. And uh, we keep you, you know, uh, we will keep uh, uh, listening to your your uh, work. Good stuff, and, and good luck to your students. And uh, you know, maybe I'm, I'll meet one or two of them. If they're going to go into composition. Oh, that would be fantastic. I, I I will keep that in mind. But thank you so much. Keep safe. Uh, I hope your family is doing well Thanks. and we keep in touch. Yes, good stuff. Perfect, take care. What an amazing conversation we just had with Robert Grayson Williams, composer of scores for video games, television and scores. It was fantastic. I want to thank you one more time before we go to our partnership with WCNY in Central New York. And of course, you, the audience. Thank you for tuning in. Please be safe. Please be kind. And I will see you or you will hear me in a new episode from Suarez. Ciao, ciao. Nos vemos. Bye bye.